So pastry is a little bit different because it's so exact and precise. We do have our recipes that we go by. The best way I like to teach other people is when I have a new recipe, I like to do it one on one with the person. That's how my chefs would do it with me. They would give me the recipe. We would work on it together. I would understand the process and and the whys of why we're doing it the way we're doing it, and then go from A to Z. Hey, what's up, guys? Jordan Anderson here, and welcome to another episode. This one's uh, got a little food theme to it. Today, we sit down with one of the owners of Pluma by Bluebird Bakery. Uh, her name's Camilla Arango, and we just talk about the baking world, how to run a bake shop, we talk about baking bakeries, uh, the business of bakeries, croissants. Yep, so her bake shop is over by Union Market in D.C. You can go check her out. It's Pluma by Bluebird Bakery. Yeah, hope you enjoy. Hope you get a little out of this, and... Uh, Let's get started. All right, I have Camilla Rango here. Camilla, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. If you want to give us uh, just like a quick five minute intro, just mm-hmm. kind of who you are, what you've been up to, what sure. you're about. Sure. So, um, about three years ago, my husband and I decided we wanted to open our own bakery. We've been pastry chefs for many, many years, um, some of the best hotels and restaurants in DC. Um, but we decided that it was time to do our own things. So um, we decided to open the bakery. I've been working on that for the past um, couple of years. And we started off as a wholesale bakery. Um, But now we have our retail location, our brick and mortar. And that's been open for about a year now. So just pretty much that's where I spend all my time. (laughs) Okay, right on. And how did you guys come up with the name for the bakery? Oh, that's a good question. What what is the name of the bakery? Um, The name of the bakery is Pluma by Bluebird Bakery. So Pluma means feather in Spanish. When we started off this venture we started off as Bluebird Bakery, right? We started getting a lot of recognition from our peers and in the D.C. area and kind of converted our bakery or while we were trying to raise funds to open our brick and mortar, we started getting all this demand for our product. So we turned into a wholesale bakery. We started doing wholesale um, in the D.C. area to about 18 different locations at one point um, and we were known as Bluebird Bakery. So when we finally had the space um, to open our retail location, we wanted to expand on the brand. So Pluma means feather in Spanish. So we decided to call it that because as a part of a bird, as a part of bluebird, pluma is a part of bluebird, right? And at pluma, we do sell more than what we sell to our wholesale um, clients. So to our wholesale clients, we just sell pastries, croissants, cookies, things like this. But at the retail location, we have pizza, salads, sandwiches. So it's a wider uh, array um, of offerings. So definitely kind of wanted to expand on that brand. And was the retail brick and mortar of Pluma, was that the, has that always been the the goal in mind or was it, have you just kind of like, as success was <laughs> revealed itself, you like you kind of, oh, maybe let's try retail. Rolled with the punches. No, it's, um, that's a good question. It actually was always the goal. We kind of never wanted to do the wholesale part. It just kind of fell in our lap. And we decided that it would be a great idea to, you know, continue to gain recognition in D.C. and keep interest in our product and stay relevant. So we said, okay, this is a good idea. Let's do the wholesale while we can establish the retail location. At that point, we were looking for a lease, a space to lease, and um, we would have to do a whole build out. So that that would be a, a bit of a, a process. So in the meantime, we said, okay, why not? Okay. And wholesale quickly is like, you just, what does that look like for a bakery? You're just making ton, a ton of bread and, and shipping it out to different 
restaurants or well like- yeah kind of um so we mainly do croissants that is our specialty um anything that's uh, laminated dough pretty much um and we can dig deeper into that if you want a little bit later but laminated doughs um are a specialty and are our specialty so when we do the wholesale we have different customers putting in orders daily we do it seven days a week and yeah we just bake a bunch of croissants and muffins and scones and cookies and deliver that daily as fresh as can be to all of our clients. And what was that like early on? Were you driving the truck yourself? Oh gosh, like, oh, like- gosh no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my husband was, and so my partner, he was doing all of the um, deliveries, which was, it was crazy. I mean, we went from something very structured from working at restaurants and hotels, you know, having kind of like set hours and set days to like, okay, managing our time, but also having to keep in mind, we have to do this so it reaches the customers as fresh as can be. And what did that mean? It meant baking at midnight and packing at three in the morning, packing up the truck and delivering all over DC. So, so yeah, it was, it was a bit of a, okay, kind of like a surprise, like, okay, this is what we're going to have to deal with. And my husband can tell you crazy stories because you're essentially working at three in the morning, four in the morning. At a loading dock. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were working out of... Thank God. We were we had a very good location. We were working out of Chinatown at that point. So we could easily access all the um, the places we needed to go fairly quickly. Um, and there was still a little bit of action in that part of the city at nights. But but yeah, he, he has a, a couple of crazy stories. <laughs> okay. And so the brick and mortar was the end goal for retail. Yes. And like... How, what's the what would you say is like the client or the customer interaction what's, what are the main differences in terms of uh, the product you're making mm-hmm. how fast you have to make it uh, mm-hmm. even just like maybe even payment or like what's the difference between like a wholesale client and just the average customer sure well with wholesale cu- clients you're dealing with a couple people that manage the accounting for the the one company or the owner for the other company and it's it's very simple because you kind of lay out the rules at the very beginning okay we're going to do pay on delivery or we're going to do net 7 which means you pay after 7 seven days or net 15 whatever your terms the terms you agree upon and it's very straightforward and that was one thing that luckily um tom and i kind of had a very good system we did adjust and tweak as we started but it's very straightforward okay yeah um with cust- dealing with customers on a daily basis it's very different because you have to please every customer you want every customer to be happy to have a great experience so they come back and so they tell their friends and so pluma becomes one of their favorite places to be and that's the end goal is making the customer feel like they had a great experience and that's hard to do when you're not there a hundred percent because you know you're running a business as well so but running a business people think like oh well you can you can bake and you can talk to the customers and it's very easy it's there's a lot of administrative work that goes into it so as much as I would personally like to be upfront giving customers you know, detailed attention every hour that we're open, it's not realistic. So then you have to deal with training staff and setting those expectations of how you want that staff to treat your customers and and how to deal with situations when customers aren't satisfied or uh, have some different expectation of what you're delivering. So that can be a little bit challenging, but... I do like to think that overall we have very happy customers and um, 
we pay a lot of attention to detail and we definitely take everything that we do very seriously and if something is not right we try to make it we try to make the wrong right immediately that's the most important thing yeah i was gonna ask you like what's your feedback loop is it a customer complaint or is it a customer compliment and then you're like all right we're gonna tweak this more butter less (laughs) flour yeah yeah we've had we've seen it all we've had people love everything that we do and say nothing but nice beautiful compliments to us and we love that but we also have customers where we don't hit the mark and 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 for some reason they don't have the experience that they're expecting and that's when you that's the opportunity that you have to take and and be like okay what can I do to make it better so you know whether that be giving the co- the customer something complimentary if their food is taking too long to cook you know you send them out something complimentary or if their order got messed up in some sort of way uh taking that off the check um you know little things that that you can do to to show the customer like hey i care i care about your experience here it might have been not what you were expecting but hey this is what i'm going to do for you and give me another opportunity so that that's all we can really do and hope that people see that our intention is is uh comes from the heart and uh will give us another opportunity <laughs> but yeah we've we've had it all we've had bad reviews good reviews everything <laughs> part of it. uh let's go back even further i mean i want to go back to uh you're growing up with food did you have a what was your was food a big part of the home growing up or, or, or did you discover food and culinary <laughs> later in life i kind of did discover it later in life so one thing my family and myself like we all we love to eat and we love good food that is undeniable um but I didn't grow up in a home per se where like grandma was cooking something really amazing every day or I don't have those childhood memories um that's not how it was for us in Colombia, you do you are exposed to beautiful fruits and vegetables and ingredients um, that I did have the luxury of growing up with. But you pretty much have um, kind of like, at least in my household, a, a set regime or a set menu that we would kind of go by uh, week to week. So um, it was pretty pretty straightforward. Um, but you've had like a dual growing up. You had, you grew yes. up some in America and also some in Colombia. Yeah. Yes, so I grew up in, yes, as you said, in D.C. I was born in Virginia, and um, I lived there until I was seven years old, and then I went to live to Columbia. So that initial thing, that initial change was very shocking to us you know because as little girls you're you're growing up with your captain crunch or your you know your, your fruity pop, pebbles Pop-tarts, yeah. your pop tarts <laughs> you know all these things that kids in the 80s would eat um and then you go to Colombia, and there's none of that oh, okay and you're like what am I supposed to <laughs> what am I supposed to eat for breakfast um, so so yeah it was a little bit difficult but we got used to it and luckily we would come back every year every year in the summer back to America so, yes back okay. to DC and we had the chance to indulge in everything that we had missed out uh, for the year so <laughs> okay well it was like what's like a standard diet in Colombia what is oh, that I mean like how a lot of rice potatoes meat fruits all these beautiful tropical fruits um, so you have like fresh fruit juices every day um, but yeah just very very wholesome foods um, what ended up being the breakfast of choice for you the breakfast Breakfast. Oh, hot chocolate. Our hot chocolate is hot amazing. Chocolate, okay. Yes, it's not like Swiss mix cocoa powder with the marshmallows. No, our hot chocolate is different. It's not very sweet, but it does have that chocolatey flavor. But we Colombians, especially, we do something very funny, and it's um, we melt cheese in our hot chocolate. 
Yeah. So it's kind of like, I want to describe it as kind of like, um, almost like a string cheese or a mozzarella. And you just, so you have your cup of hot chocolate and you cut little pieces of cheese and you throw it in there. And as you're drinking your hot chocolate and you're maybe dipping some French bread in there, um, you grab a spoon and you start spooning out these little pieces of melted cheese. And it's the weirdest thing. And I know it sounds yeah, kind like, of gross. Uh, like French onion soup, but hot chocolate. But hot chocolate, okay. yes, with bread and cheese. Um, but yeah, no, it's delicious. It's okay. definitely, you have to try it if you're ever in Colombia. And what, I mean, I, you speak as much as you want about this, but like, do you know the kind of the history of Colombian cuisine? Or like, is it, was it, did it start in Spain? Well, or I mean, it, we um, were conquered by the Spanish. Um, so there's a lot of uh, roots that, you know, from there, we do share similar um, forms of cuisine. Or like the same palate almost? A little bit, yeah. Okay. But we also, Colombia is such a rich country in terms of like fruits and vegetables that you don't get that in Spain. So, I mean, and the other thing is that Colombia, yes, we were conquered by the Spanish, but we have... It's such a versatile country because we have the Caribbean, we have the Amazon, we have the mountains. Just so di the diversity of everything. Di yes, yeah. it's very diverse by region. So in the Caribbean, you know, you have those Afro-Colombian roots, those beautiful, um, you know, tropical fruits, coconut, coconut, rice coconut. That's delicious. It's like a um, rice that they cook with coconut oh, and okay. a so little like a bit of rice, like brown bit. sugar. Oh, wow. It's delicious. Um, but a lot of seafood and and things of the sort. So that you'll find in the Caribbean. But in the mountainous regions, that's where all the potatoes grow. So a lot of potato rich dishes, like the traditional dish that I grew up um, eating is called a hiaco. And it's a Colombian soup made with three different types of potato so it's very hearty um it's meant to be filling to keep you warm on those cold days in the mountain so so yeah the the cuisine ranges and varies a lot um but it's also yummy <laughs> oh, nice and so you found the culinary edge later in life. Yes, you I did. did. You didn't have the, you know, grandma cooking at home. I didn't. You had, how, how did it come about where you like, I want to do this as a career or like I'm more interested than just making food at home? Well, that's a good question. Um, so I, when I was in Colombia, um, I started off doing um, my university studies there and I was doing biology and chemistry. And that is what I was going to study. Um, I wanted to be a, a marine biologist. Um, but it, it was hard. I mean, it was a lot of studying. It was hard. I loved the biology part. I didn't love the chemistry part that much. So I would study, study, study so, so much um, that I would find myself wanting to de-stress some sort of way and for some people that's exercise for some people they take their stress out in a different way for me it was cooking so the one thing I didn't have I didn't have the grandma cooking at home but I had all these amazing cookbooks that my mom had bought when she lived here in the states and by amazing cookbooks I'm not it's not like today this is the 80s so it's Betty Crocker and it's those old school Joy of Cooking Joy of Cooking okay. and Bon Appetit magazines uh, okay. and I would find myself eyeing the magazines and the cookbooks and, and looking at the pictures and thinking oh my god that looks so yummy I wish I could make that and then one day I just decided like I'm gonna make a pie that's what I'm gonna do I'm so stressed out I don't wanna hit the books anymore I need to like just relax for a little bit I'm gonna make a pie so I opened my mom's Betty Crocker uh, book to like all American apple pie and I made a pie and it came out really good and first time yeah it uh, came out good surprisingly okay um, and from then on out I, I just like really enjoyed 
the feeling that cooking would give me. And I started off in pastry because that's kind of like where I gravitated to. Like I wanted to cook, but also like make something super, super yummy to enjoy later with mm -hmm. my family. Did any of the science background affect the pastry? Because like baking is very scientific. Yes, it oh, is. Like. It is. And that I do feel like it did help me because in pastry, you have to weigh and measure everything. It has to be very exact. So with my kind of like scientific brain, I was I always loved doing that part, like weighing out, making like the little potions, you know, making weighing out every ingredient for the experiment. So. I, f I found myself like it related so much to pastry that I just I loved it yep <laughs> so from there you just kept making and then did you finish that marine biology degree or did you drop out and say I'm going to culinary school no what, what happened? I dropped out <laughs> <laughs> um, after uh, three years of university I said you know what this isn't really this isn't really what I want to do um, and by then Uh, cooking had really become something I was super interested in um, so I was like but what if I try to make a living out of something that I enjoy doing so much and I started researching um, and researching how to even dive into that and being in Colombia you didn't have culinary schools like you did here like the CIA or the Le Cordon Bleu uh, schools where you could learn those programs like that wasn't a thing back then so I was like okay if I ha if I want to really pursue this as a career I'm gonna have to move back to the states and and find a culinary school where I could do this um, and that's what I did <laughs> okay who was like Who was an early advocate of the whole cooking experience? Did you have anybody in your corner that was like, you can do this? Or was it your whole family just like, you're crazy, Camilla? Yeah, like, pretty much. I hate to say it, but I did have a lot of pushback. Um, a lot of people that were like, we don't we don't understand. Mm -hmm. You want to you be a cook. You're three years into this. Just yeah. do one more year and you're done. Um, yeah, they they didn't really get why I wanted to do it. And but I've always been a little bit stubborn <laughs> and I've always been a little bit independent. And I just I just knew that that was what I wanted to do. And I kind of had already set my mind that I don't care what anyone says, I'm going to do it and I'm going to prove them wrong and I'm going to show them that I can be successful at this, that even if it's not what they have envisioned for me, I'm going to make this successful for me. And uh, so, so what does yeah. a culinary school regiment look like? Is that four years, two years, one year? It's one year. Okay. It's a one year and then you do like an externship program and then you're done. Um, so it was a total of one year and four months for me. Um, I graduated and then from there on out, I've just been building my career the best way um, I possibly could, which for me meant, okay, gaining as much experience from the best chefs that I could learn from. Okay. Um, Who were those early chefs that you gravitated towards or that you tried to get a job well, with? Well, I started off at the Ritz-Carlton, so that's where I did my externship. Mm -hmm. And um, that was very, very rewarding. And it was very interesting. You have to understand, I had never worked in a professional kitchen before. So... There were a lot of kids that would go to school and yes, they had had worked at this restaurant and this and, and been a, already a line cook here and there. I had none of that experience. So going into a hotel, it's like everything's brand new, right? You're working on the line of the restaurant or the line of room service or working in the pastry kitchen. The fun thing about the externship was that you got to rotate through all the kitchens. So... I got to see a little bit of everything. But at that um, Ritz-Carlton where I was working at, I got to do two weeks as part of my externship at Maestro, which um, if you know about the DC dining scene, um, that was uh, one of Fabio Trabocchi's first restaurants here in um, DC. He worked there as a chef, and it was the hardest two weeks of my life. 
Um, and I said, okay, I'm definitely not prepared to do this now, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna get better at my craft and I'm going to come back and I'm going to work here. It, it, it was just the day one there was like, you know, they start you off like picking herbs and, and chopping onions or, you know, doing very basic things, but it was so strict. It, the 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 way they had the kitchen um, set up and how everyone was just so strict and professional and serious about what they were doing and it was almost like the chef <laughs> was instilling the fear of God on everyone so like if you messed up you did it you did not want to be the person to mess up so that's what it felt like when I was there this is the, the kitchen I imagine where it's like cussing yelling uh, like yes like you're, uh, you're standing so, up straight like please yes. don't mess up please don't mess up exactly kind of Gordon Ramsay-esque um, without so much of the cussing yes there was cussing here and there sometimes but not as bad um but but yes it was th that type of environment um you know at that time maestro was a triple a five diamond restaurant so it, it had a very high rating um and the food it was fine dining the food was beautiful and amazing and there were things that i had never seen that i'm like what is this what is this ingredient and they had foie gras and caviar and amazing wines and champagnes it was just you know like child being at Willy Wonka's factory and just being able to see all of this amazing food and, and, and the plates were Versace and it was just amazing and I'm like okay I'm definitely not prepared to be here right now <laughs> um, but I'm gonna come back and I, I'm gonna work here and and I did I did. Um, so I had a two two hard weeks, and they would make me clean out entire shelves and drawers, and be on my knees and scrub things clean, or you know, uh, degut fish, or you know, declaw lobsters, and my hands would end up red and full of uh, you know little cuts and nicks, and and it was just hard. But I knew that if I wanted to be successful, I needed to work in that kitchen so when you were in those environments and you eventually worked in restaurants mm -hmm. full-time what what was like what's like your style of learning do you need someone to show you or or this what was the style that that was available for you to learn in those environments was it the chef shows you exactly how to do a recipe or is it just kind of like absorbing just by being there or like um, sure so pastry is a little bit different because it's so exact and precise we do have our recipes that we go by and so learning the best way for me to learn and that's and the the best way I like to teach other people is when I have a new recipe I like to do it one-on-one -on -one with the person and um, that's how my chefs would do it with me they would give me the recipe we would work on it together I would understand the process and and the whys of why we're doing it the way we're doing it and then go from A to Z and we would do everything together until we had the end product and that's how I learned and and then after that after you're being shown how to do it once you're kind of expected to learn and to know how to do it the next time on your own Pretty much. I mean, yes, obviously you can ask questions and, and things like that. But yeah, you are expected to take notes and kind of like soak it all in. And and if you're being shown once, you should be able to, to execute it. And within baking and pastry, how much trial and error is there with recipes or... Oh, the, there's a lot. Or just like, you know, the oven didn't circulate quite the right way, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, everything affects pastry. And this is especially true when it comes to vinoiserie, so that laminated dough. Everything affects it. And I mean, I've been doing pastry for 15 years and there's still days and times when things can go wrong. And even going back to... Um, 
when we were doing the wholesale business, we had to, during our wholesale um, period, which was like three years, we had to move after a year, we have to move from one location to another location. And when we started in that location, our croissants weren't coming out. Like we had a couple of days where we couldn't send our clients croissants because they were not coming out. And we did not know what was happening. We couldn't figure it out. And that's because everything affects pastry. The heat, the humidity, the time, the temperature, everything. So you have to be very careful and you have to be very knowledgeable to to be able to execute and I mean but you know it's life and people aren't perfect and, and mistakes happen and they still happen to me um, today so you know you just have to kind of take it with a grain of salt and be like okay well what what w- try to think like where could I have gone wrong where could I have taken a misstep and how do I fix it or how do I prevent it from happening the next time so even like a rainy day versus a sunny day could change the outcome. Well, thankfully now we have a, something a very kind of climate controlled. Okay. We in, in the kitchen we have a cold room, so it's one room where we do all of our lamination. That's mm-hmm. temperature and uh, humidity controlled. So okay. that helps a lot. But oh. yeah, even even a hot rainy day or a hot and humid day can can affect uh, your outcome, the outcome of your product. Okay. Let's go into the process of making a croissant and <laughs> and getting that laminated dough cuz it's I know there's so much there's temperature, there's butter at the right temperature, mm-hmm. there's folding. How do yes. how do we like Start us from scratch. Sure. So, well, we have to start off with what we call a butter block. Um, so it's essentially we butter is super important. It's kind of like the main ingredient in croissants, right? So we start off with a high percent fat butter, eighty three percent fat. Um, you don't want anything less than that. Um, so, and then what we do is we, the butter comes in pounds. Um, so we take two pounds, cut it in half, and then we kind of have to like knock it out and make a perfect kind of like little flat rectangle. And that's the butter. That's what we call a butter block. And that's the butter that we're going to use to, um, make our croissant. And what you're doing essentially is you're, you're making like a little book, um, you make your dough, you let that dough rest. That dough has to rest for, it has to do what we call a, a, a bulk fermentation. And it has to rest for 12 hours. That dough is, yes, a flour, water. Um, we use a little bit of starter, um, but we use a sponge. Um, so kind of like a natural uh, yeast. Um, a little bit of sh- uh, sugar in there as well, a little bit of salt and milk. Um, so we make the dough that has to rest for 12 hours. Then you you degas the dough because the dough's it's going to rest, but it has yeast in it, right? So it's going to get puffy, puffy, puffy. And you have to kind of like um, degas it. So kind of like squish out all the air that has formed. And then you kind of flatten that out and you're ready to start your lamination which means fold, making your book and putting in your folds. So we, we stretch it out. It gets kind of long and thin. And then we put the butter right in the middle and we fold each end to kind of cover the uh, butter. Okay. Um, and and then we, we start rolling it out. We roll it out, and then we do another fold, and then we roll it out, and we do another fold, and then it has to rest. And then we do the process again. So at the end result, you're going to have, if you look at the dough, you're going to see... It's it's a, it's like a book. It's like taking a book, uh, dough butter, dough butter, dough butter, and that's and, good, and that's what get those layers like the that's flaky, what's gonna get flaky those layers. layers. Mm-hmm. And then okay. you have to roll it all out and then get it flat, 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 and then you can start cutting your triangles to make your croissants. And is there like a lucky number that you fold? Is it seven that you fold it twelve um, times? That's a good question. So I fold it, you have to fold it two times, and then I think it's a total of 
six or seven times that you have to do it. Mm -hmm. But it's always a folding and rotating, rolling out, folding, rotating, and rolling out. And with your cold room, that helps when you're like... If you're working the butter, it starts yes. to melt a little bit. Uh, well, well, since so the one of the important things to do when you're making croissants, you have to make sure that the butter and the dough are the same consistency or texture not necessarily temperature so you're not going to take the temperature of the butter and of the dough but it has to be the same consistency which means the butter isn't too cold because it'll break on you and it's not too warm because then it'll like splat out so it has to be yeah it has to be just the right temperature for you to use um the right consistency and the cold room does help it from getting overworked or or melting out so from there you take your triangles roll them up mm-hmm. like the Pillsbury Doughboy commercial <laughs> yeah, and then kind of. and then you bake it and that's pretty much it no, no. you don't bake it you oh. have to after that you have to proof them oh, so okay. if you see a croissant or if you see one of our croissants um, when you start it starts out tiny it starts out about like what is this like two inches three inches two inches and then you have to proof it and you have to proof it for five Five hours so and that's gonna make it the croissant get puffy 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 um and gonna get that yeast nice and developed and and then you can bake it oh okay and then so it's a long process yeah and, and i'm trying to imagine like on the wholesale side where you're trying to do like mass quantities of these are you trying to do a hundred of these or two hundred of these like how is there like a machine now that does so, that yes. or, or is so, so all we by have, hand yeah no 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 we could never do it all by hand <laughs> we started off that way and we're like okay we can't do this um, we have a machine called a sheeter and that's essentially um, uh, an, an electric rolling pin if you will and um, that's going to help you roll it out yeah, so so it's automatic. But other than that, I mean, the mixing of the dough you do in a, in a mixer, in like a, a big commercial grade Hobart mixer, if you will. Um, and then you use your sheeter to, to roll out the dough. Um, and then the cutting we do by hand. And then the rolling out of the croissants we do by hand. Okay, wow. Or the shaping. Mm-hmm. May, let's talk about... Maybe we can go, like, on a society level, a broader cultural level. Like, we could talk about, like, bread, how, like, bread, like, has just kind of become sort of, like, enemy number one. Gluten is enemy number one. Um, No, and I get it. Um, I mean, there are a lot of people that have gluten intolerances or that eat a lot of bread and, and don't feel good. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're allergic to gluten like that is a serious condition being celiac is a serious condition that means that you can't be anywhere near flour or a tiny bit of flour can can really cause you harm whereas a gluten intolerance is just that it's going to make your tummy upset I get that a lot of people don't like to eat gluten because they don't like to feel upset but it's a it's a personal choice, and I do feel sad that people have given bread this like bad rap of like bread is the enemy. It's not. It's not. It, it, I don't feel that way. I don't feel that way about food. I I always feel that moderation is key. So you can enjoy bread, and you can enjoy sweets and croissants, and as long as you do it with moderation. Mm-hmm. And that's key. Or even the difference between like factory made breads versus like how you guys make bread. Yeah. So it's also looking at at those ingredients and okay, what is going into this bread? This bread has a list of like 20 or 25 ingredients. It might, it's not going to be the most natural for you. It's not going to be the best for you. So you want to seek out those products that are artisanally made. and, And that means made with high quality ingredients few ingredients and kind of like the old fashioned way so and and 
I feel like obviously those products are definitely better for you. And again, if you eat them in moderation, it should be fine. Yeah. Because breads, I mean, from just like a ba- like if basic home cook, mm-hmm. bread seems so complicated, but it's... But it's really not. It's just simple ingredients. It's very simple ingredients. The only thing is that bread is a living thing, which means it has yeast in it. And yeast is a living thing. So you have to nurture it. You have to. So we we make our bread with a, a starter and you have to feed that starter every day. It's like your baby. You can't not like you can't let your starter die and that's being very attentive and and nurturing your your product nurturing your bread um but again it's those natural ingredients and it's that natural way of making things that's gonna make the product i feel better for you as a whole better for you in terms of health in terms of how you're gonna feel after you eat it um and even in terms of like okay maybe how much weight I'm gonna put on if I eat you know something that's a little bit more natural than something that's full of preservatives and processed ingredients what is one product that you guys have worked on that kind of gave you a lot of trouble in developing it or like getting the recipe just right the croissants. The croissants. <laughs> so um, when we started, I mean, yes, we knew how to make croissants, but it was never a specialty of ours. Like we had to, this was a lot of trial and error to get to where we are today. So it was a lot of practice, a lot of playing around with the recipe, seeing what worked, what worked for us in our environment and also how how to handle it how to handle the dough how to handle the bulk fermentation how to handle the process because making croissants is a, a two day process pretty much so how to kind of like be ahead two days so you can plan ahead and so you can give your customers what they need um so so yeah that that was the trickiest one for us to kind of pinpoint okay well what does like a failed croissant look like is it just like miserable sad looking it's (laughs) sad looking um (laughs) yes it well i mean you can have several outcomes so like if the croissant didn't proof correctly it can one of the ways to tell that you don't have a good product is that after you bake it, if you see grease or if you see that some of the butter has leaked out, you're not putting out a good product. So, and that can come from <clears throat> from the proofing or from your butter not being the right temperature when you were making the croissant so it'll just leak out when you bake it when you bake a croissant it shouldn't be greasy it should be light it should be airy and it shouldn't be in a pile of butter or or yeah, or, yeah it grease. just means the butter's not in the yeah. in the pastry it, that can happen yeah. um or it can also get misshapen so like you know you start off with a little triangle and then it kind of like turns on one side and it ends up being like a little crescent roll like a little spiral um and that's just from misshaping the dough or from poorly placing it on the tray when you're gonna um proof it um but yeah no a lot a lot of things can happen with chocolate croissants if you roll them too tight um and you don't place it correctly on the tray it the top layer can fold o- over uh it can open up on you so, and it can expose some of your chocolate so and it'll be misshapen so there's a lot of little things that you have to be very uh, pay a lot of attention to detail to mm-hmm. get the product just right okay let's talk uh let's talk about the future of pluma and uh, wh- what does the future look like is it is it franchising to a, another store another bakery is it is it staying like um i mean i definitely think pluma started off as a mom and pop um owned bakery my husband and myself so i don't know if we want to franchise and go uh, national or international. I don't see that in the books for us. Um, 
I just, I think I would be happy if we would be able to open maybe a couple more shops um, in the city. And that's about it. <laughs> I'm not very ambitious. I don't want to be all over the United States of America. I don't want to be in every grocery store. I want to keep it kind of simple and, and what, it, what it is and um, true to its roots. So I would be happy if we opened maybe two or three more retail locations. You're running a bakery, but there's also, yes, you're making the pastries. But what about the business side of it? Like, and how much... Of the, like you talked about the administration side, like how much, uh, where are you finding a balance between as a as a business owner to do what you started doing, which was baking, making pastries, to then now you're kind of backing away from the process yeah. and managing it. Yeah, and that's kind of, that's, um, that's a hard part about opening a business is that, okay, you have to, you get to stop kind of like being in the kitchen every day and, and cooking you have to take on a role where you're okay so you have a business now so you have to protect the finances of the business you have to protect okay where uh where am i getting product from who am i getting product am i getting the best quality product i can overseeing all that overseeing staff it's a lot and um unfortunately i definitely feel that that's something that they don't teach at Colin school and they should because a lot of these people you know go to culinary school but not necessarily all all of the people that go to culinary school want to like work for a hotel or work for a big chain some people want to open their own a lot of people want to open their own restaurant or their own bakery or their own um deli or whatever it may be and they don't give you all of those tools that you need to be a, su a successful business person so for us that has been a lot of like learning as you go um yeah so we obviously we did have administrative roles um in our past jobs um so we knew a lot going into it but there's always there's always so much that that you just have to kind of go as you go learn as you go um and those are the things that i feel like tom and i are dealing with right now that have been that have posed the most challenge for us definitely is is getting that um managing that business um in the best way we can yeah awesome well camille where can we find pluma where where are we located websites instagram all sure. that sure um so we are located in the union market district um, we are on Morse Street, so 391 Morse Street Northeast, um, and you will find us there from 7 to 5 um, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and um, 7 through 8 the rest of the week. Um, and we open at 8 on the weekends. Um, you can also check out our Instagram. That's Pluma by Bluebird um, or our Facebook. Okay. And the best time to get the best croissants? First thing in the morning? I mean, I all definitely, day long. I mean, yes, we have them all day. Um, we do sell out of the most popular. So I definitely think going early is the best um, time to go if you want to get the freshest croissants and you want to have your pick of the whole lot. Because we do have um, croissants that are very popular and tend to sell out. And unfortunately, as I explained, croissants are a two day process. So it's not like we can say, let me just whip up another batch. Um, unfortunately, that's not how it works with the croissants. So um, we only have a certain amount per day and we do tend to sell out. So come early. All right. Well, Camilla, thanks for being on the show. <laughs> Thank you for having me. All right. So this, that was Camilla Orango. Hope you enjoyed that. Hope you learned a little bit about baked goods, breads and pastries and croissants and all that stuff and the business behind it. If you want to go to Instagram, go to Pluma by Bluebird and you'll find all their stuff. Great. Just great photos. Uh, if you want to go check out their actual shop, 
Uh, it is over in the Union Market area in D.C. Thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for listening to the Jordan P. Anderson Podcast. If you haven't already subscribed to this podcast, be sure to subscribe so you can get every episode when it comes out and get the alerts. Uh, leave a rating if you want to, f- you know, f- one star, two star, five stars, whatever you want to do. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not judging you. If you want to get a little bit more details about some of these people, if you're a little bit, if you want to get a little bit more detail about uh, some of our podcast guests, or if you want to be on the podcast yourself, go to jordanpanderson.com slash blog. You'll be able to find all the details there. Again, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.